One, two, one, two, uh, citizens, man, we're in for a treat right now. This is something, at one point in my career, I always wanted to bring this conversation to the airwaves. I think it's a conversation that could be beneficial to you for many reasons, especially in these times. In this time of the pandemic, we've been finding people who have found different remedies to heal themselves, not just physically, spiritually, as well as mentally. And I wanted to have our next two guests on to talk about different ways that you can heal yourself that are unconventional, but they are indigenous in their origin. And we're talking about psych psychedelic assisted therapy and plant-based medicines. And with that said, I want to introduce to you our first guest. He's a practicing psychotherapist with training in internal family systems. Uh, he's currently serves as a director of policy and regulatory affairs for Fluence, which is a company that has trained more than 1000 mental health professionals in psychedelic assisted therapy he recently left the role at dep as a deputy director for the Pennsylvania Office of Ad Advocacy and Reform, and he's here to share his experiences and his information with you to all of our benefit. Please welcome to the show the one and only Victor Cabral. Vic, Vic, hey. Vic! Welcome to the show, Vic. I hey, appreciate you, Sway. I'm happy to be here. It's an honor. Man, that might have been one of the hardest intros I had to give, man. <laughs> a lot of multi-syllable words there, brother. Uh, yeah. But um, th congratulations on your career and all that you've done. And joining us, we're not alone, is a powerful young lady who's the founder of Black Therapist Rock, which has over 30,000 mental health professionals around the world. Uh, she herself is a licensed therapist, a therapist focused on understanding solutions for racial trauma and other legal uh, legacy burdens. Prior to her advocacy work with Black Therapist Rock, she served in the U.S. Air Force for 18 years, and she barely looks 18 years of age as I sit down with her right now and realize I got to start working out. Please welcome her to the show, Duran Young. Duran, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, okay. excited. Well, I'm excited, too, because I feel like uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I want to be educated in this conversation as well as our audience and the two of you don't just talk about it, you live it. You know, this is a part of your lifestyle. This is uh, practices that you guys have acquired over the years, and, and now you become advocates of. And so I want to start with our first question. Uh, Duran, you're a black woman. Victor, you're an Afro-Latino man. Both of you guys are using your healing journey with psychedelics to help others, especially women and people of color. This is a really interesting topic what made you want to use this healing journey to help others i'm gonna start with you vic yeah um i'm i think i'm a very firm believer in that i don't recommend anything to anyone that i haven't tried myself right and um you know in 2010 i, I dropped out of school i was dropped out right i got kicked out lost my apartment i was 300 pounds and um I went on this journey to get physically fit. And at the end of that, I realized like I'm physically fit now, but something's going on in my mind. Like there's something uh, beyond the physical that I need to address. And um, I started going to therapy and eventually hit a wall with that as well, where I, I knew something was wrong and I couldn't get to it. And um, I remembered a friend of mine in college that shared his experience with me with you know that he had with psychedelics at the time and I was too young and not aware enough to understand what he was telling me but the story stuck in my mind and so in 2016 you know I made the decision like I'm gonna seek this out I spent about a year doing my research looking at uh you know science looking mm. at people's reports of it um and really being like I think this is something that is going to help me in my next step in life and um so in 2016 for the first time i tried it um and it changed my life it really did so after that i after that first experience i knew that this was the work that i should be doing um so yeah. you know the natural follow-up question to that is yeah. what was that first experience like can you describe it what you felt i was in my room by myself you know i had somebody who cared about me who um you know i had told what was going on so I could be safe and the the best way that I can explain it is you know uh Shrek says that we're like onions right that ogres are like onions and the best way that I could explain it was uh I started peeling back the layers mm -hmm. right of like the labels um 
their expectations, uh, all of that, and just peeling back, peeling back, peeling back until I got to the center and the core of who I am. And the answer to that was love, right? Um, and that completely just blew my mind, right? It's like the answer was right in front of me this whole time. I just got to love people, um, love myself, and I could live a happy life. And that realization really took my work and took my relationships to a whole different level. Does that insight, did the insight that you gained from that first time experience, because you mentioned that you got your body right, you got your physical right, but something wasn't correct in your head. So that insight that you gained, um, number one, is did it sustain when you were sober? And then number two, did that experience correct what wasn't right in your head? <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah, it's sustained. Okay. Um, it's, you know, that was seven years ago, uh, you know, five, six, I mean, six or seven years ago. And luckily for me, right when I had that experience, it was the summer before I got accepted into my master's program of so, for social work. So I went from having this really profound experience to then going into this program that broke down all of the systemic issues, mental mm. health issues. And so I was so hungry for that knowledge and I was able to use my graduate education as my integration, right? Um, did it fix anything? Um, I think it helped me continue to grow and be on this path. But till this day, I, I think growth and healing is a lifelong process. And so I'm just starting to really embody what it is to take care of myself physically, mm -hmm. you know, to take care of myself mentally and spiritually. Um, and so I'm still going through the process, man. Six years later is still, you know, the process of integrating and learning and, um, and learning from the mistakes, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Vic. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I got more questions on that, but I want to hear from you, Duran about your healing journey and why was it so important for you to share it with others, especially people of color and women? Yeah, so for me, this is deeply personal, okay. um, like deep in my bones, deep in my blood personal. Um, I come from a long generation of people who are very strong but also suffering and weren't allowed to say that they were suffering, you know, silently suffering. Um, I'm about five generations removed from slavery down in Texas, mm -hmm. uh, where I'm from. And I am an 80s baby, even though you said I don't look over 18. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the 80s, kind of at the peak of the war on drugs. The crack era. Right. Mm -hmm. My mom was addicted to crack, actually. Um, and I, I now know as a professional that she was medicating her depression. Mm -hmm. uh, she had three babies by the time she was 19 years old, little to no support, um, poor. You know, no, the fathers were not involved. And I think she just turned to what, what was available at the time. And I think that so many of us as black and brown people, we don't have what we need. We don't have the tools. We don't have access to the things that other people are using to help thrive, you know, to help them be well in life and to have beautiful relationships and, you know, wonderful careers. We're just trying to survive yes. oftentimes. When mm -hmm. you're in the hood, you got three kids running around, you're trying to figure out how to feed them. You don't have time to make an appointment and go see a therapist mm -hmm. and talk about your problems. You're trying to figure your problems out because those problems are hooked to survival, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I became a therapist because I, I saw the struggles that my mom went through and, and subsequently we went through, you know, abuse, um, I live with my grandmother on and off, a lot of 80s babies, you know, we were raised partially by our grandparents and the abandonment and the absence of our parents and really the the overwhelm of our grandparents. Our grandparents didn't know what to do with us because a lot of them were only in their 50s or yeah. 40s, you know, yeah, still true. trying to live their life and figure out life for themselves. And my grandmother would say, you know, I had three kids. I raised them. I'm done, mm -hmm. you know. And so really I was raising myself. And I just, I would look around and I would say, so many people that look like me are suffering. Why? And does I'm a little kid. No one else sees this. Mm -hmm. No one sees that, you know, when you roll through the projects, everybody's hungry. All the kids look like they uncared for. Like, does do people not see this or do they not care? So when I went to school, I joined the military, like mm -hmm. you said, at 18 years old, fresh out of high school, because I was homeless. That You know, like when people ask me, did you join to, you know, fight for your country? No, you I for joined shelter. to eat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you needed a I bed. was hungry. <laughs> yes. Right. And I wanted to go to college. You know, I was super smart, but I knew we were broke. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be broke in college. I saw a lot of people doing that. And I was like, I'm tired of being broke. 
So we have a military base where I'm from, and I was like, I'm going to join the military. And, and a lot of people are like, how did you do it as a black woman in a very white world? I had already been living that. I'm from Texas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it was nothing new to have to navigate whiteness for my survival. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, you know, in America, it's not ideal. Most black people don't get to where I, I got with the statistics that I was born under. You know, so to me, every moment is a miracle. Like the fact that literally the fact that I'm alive is a miracle. Yeah. I told Victor this story when we were having an, an experience together, psychedelic experience together. I had this big epiphany um, on my 39th birthday because the shaman that we were with, shout out to the Ancestor Project in Baltimore, they were like, remember your name before you were born. How many of us even think about before we were born? You know, what was, what was my mom dealing with when she was carrying me? You know, what was her mother dealing with when she was carrying the eggs that would eventually produce me? We come from generations of mm. trauma. And that is in our body. That's, you know, it gets passed down through the blood. Mm-hmm. So my mom, actually, when she got pregnant with me at 16, she went and told her mom that she was pregnant. And, you know, a lot of old school mothers back in that day, if you got pregnant as a teenager, you was going to get out. You was going to have to figure it out. And so my grandmother actually paid for her to have an abortion. Wow. But because I'm from Texas, which is a gift and a curse sometimes to me, um, because I'm from Texas, they're super conservative about abortion. They required her to watch a film about the risk. And one of the risks was that she would never have a child again. So when I think about what was my name before I was born, that's love. Yeah. Yeah sacrifice you know that to me I could never yes I could be mad about you know all the things that we went through as children and the the harshness of our childhood and you know all the things that I saw my my mom my sister actually witnessed my mom doing drugs one time and it, she's traumatized you know we all have these very traumatic memories of our childhood but when I think about you know all that my mom gave me she gave me life yeah that's it that's all and that's all you needed and, and I knew that I was loved, you know, mm-hmm. because of psychedelics. My whole entire life, I wondered, you know, I had low self-esteem. I had a lot of issues around confidence and being a dark-skinned black woman. I really struggled with, like, who am I? What am I? Where do I belong? Mm-hmm. But all I need to know is that I belong in love, mm-hmm. you know, that I belong wherever I'm at because I'm loved, because I'm here, because I exist. So for me, like I said, it's, it's extremely personal. Mm-hmm. I myself have been diagnosed with PTSD and depression. And it's still not an easy route. It's not an easy road, you know, but I'm glad that I get to have the resources and tools to help me along this journey. Wow. That's powerful. Um, Extremely powerful. Thank Mm -hmm. you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. A couple of things come to mind because I want, I I hope at the end of the, at the end of this conversation, we can alleviate, uh, eradicate some of the, stereotypes and the stigmas and the, and the myths that have been applied to psychedelic assisted therapy or, or plant-based medicines. Um, when you mention you, you being an 80s baby and you, and you talk about the crack era, uh, it immediately also pushed my mind back to the 60s and the 70s. Mm-hmm. I wasn't there in the 60s, but we know the history of the 60s and the 70s. Those were two prominent decades when it came in the 50s, when it came to psychedelics. Um, and it, it, that's where a lot of the stigma was born. That's where a lot of it was created. Uh, A lot of those studies and those practices were pushed to the side because of some of the results that were reported from that time. Um, uh, addiction, people talked about addiction. Um, people compared it to heroin. They Mm. compared it to any other type of opioid, you know, that might've been around at that time. And it just walked, a, it, psychedelics had a bad stigma, right? But you guys have seen something different. You know, you were in the Air Force for 18 years. I've done some work with a lot of uh, service members who have came back from shock and awe in Iraq. Um, different programs I've been a part of where I would see, like, just young, young service people who are really going through a lot of mental anguish. And then I learned that a lot of, service ex-service members or current service members sometimes commit suicide because of it at the tune of 22 service members a day might commit suicide Mm -hmm. based on mental health issues so i would love you to kind of elaborate on the benefits that you've seen from former and current service members who have utilized psychedelic therapy or plant-based medicines to help their mental health issues can you speak to that 
Yeah, I would say the biggest the biggest challenge for most veterans and especially black veterans is mm-hmm. reintegrating into society once you've been considered an outsider. Mm-hmm. And you're considered, you know, in the military it's like them against us, civilians versus folks that are actually in the military. And it is its own world. You know, in order to be a trained killer, there's a certain mindset that goes with that. Even if you're not the one, you know, squeezing the trigger, pushing the button, as a therapist who was supporting killers, you know, I had to, at the end, you know, make, make terms with that. And as even for me, as I was leaving the military, I was conflicted. My conscience was not very clear. It, it felt like there was this heavy burden on me that I, especially as a black person, I'm supporting something, supporting war, supporting American domination of the world, yeah. you know, um, it, when that's the same power entity that dominated my own community. So how do you rectify it's that in your, in your mind? A, yeah, right. Yeah. And people ask me that, and I said, you know, we're always survival first. So for all those years, I was I didn't think about it. You know, I tried to help as many people as I could. Um, I saw that even in that setting, people were suffering. And, and my goal is to always try to be a place of light and love, you know, where there's darkness. And there's a lot of darkness in the military because it attracts people who were homeless like mm-hmm. me, you know, <laughs> um, people who had childhood similar to mine. And so I did therapy in the military for about eight years, but I worked in the hospital settings for 18 years. And I started to realize that the main thing that struck people in the military should really struggle with was loneliness, something that we call chronic loneliness. And um, actually, suicide prevention was my biggest job when I was stationed in Italy. And I saw that, you know, you can put people in the the most, you know, restful environment. I mean, Italy is a beautiful country, but your trauma goes wherever you go. And you you can't outrun it. And that's typically people in the military are very high functioning. I mean, probably the people that are listening to this consider themselves to be high functioning. You know, bills are paid, um, able to go to work, able to do all the things, but still very empty on the inside. And so when you see that, and you can see through all the bullshit, you know, through mm-hmm. all the mask, all the layers of the onion, like yeah. you said, all the toughness, and you see this, you know, this person who thinks they're broken, that thinks they're not worth living, that really feel like they have no reason to live. I can relate to that as a human. You know, I've been there. Mm-hmm. And so when people talk about suicide like it's some faraway thing, if you've never woke up in the morning and said, what is this all for? You're, you're unique. Yeah. I would say every, most humans that I've met in my life, will say that they've had moments where they weren't quite sure if it was, you know, worth going on for. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, suicide in the military is a thing. We say die by suicide instead of commit suicide because okay. we want it's the, it. The real issue is depression. Yeah. Right. Untreated depression. And when people go untreated for months, years, decades, um, it builds up and it becomes overwhelming. So, you know, people feel isolated, lonely and depressed. And that's just a, a, a real um you know, a, a combination for something really bad to happen if they don't get something, some relief mm-hmm. from somewhere. So when I meet people who say, you know, I'm tired of living, it's not that they want to die. They're willing to die because they're in so much pain. Die by suicide. Appreci- I appreciate that. Yeah. I hadn't heard that phrase up until that point. And so you've literally watched people who were going through that mm-hmm. um, take on psychedelic therapy and you saw it improve or help well, like situation. I said, in the, in the actual military setting, psychedelics is forbidden. Okay. So I can speak from my own personal story because I don't want to out anybody. Okay. But I can say from my own personal story, I was, like I said, once upon a time suicidal um, in the military. Okay. Had just gotten divorced, was now a single mother in Italy, mm-hmm. trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, what I really wanted for my life, and um, not feeling fulfilled. Just wasn't, like, what is it for? I'm paying bills, going to work, but what is it all for? Um and for me, it really was about my hormonal balance, too. A lot mm-hmm. of times we don't, real, we don't realize how much hormones play a role in our mental health. Our nutrition plays a role in our mental health, whether we're sleeping or not, whether, you know, whether we're moving our bodies enough. And when we're depressed, those are like all the things that we stop doing. We stop going out with friends. We stop um, eating well. We start gaining weight or losing weight. We stop <coughs> sleeping. Um, and so for me... Like, I was kind of on this path to just stop caring about my health. I was like, well, I had thyroid surgery. My hormones were all over the place. I was, you know, getting more and more depressed, and there was no answer for it. Uh, The answer was a steroid for the rest of my life. They're like, this is a steroid that you take for the rest of your life. You're going to be depressed. You're going to have no energy. This is your life now. I quickly gained weight. I gained like 40 pounds, which made me more depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just stopped, I just gave up. I was like, well, you know, this is this is it. This is my options. 
Um, and for me, when I got into psychedelics, it was really about, I was pre-diabetic, so it was about health. You know, I wanted to find the, the shaman said, you know, you're invited to find your way back to health. I didn't want to do it the white way. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be on a whole lot of pills. You know, I didn't want to. And that's what they were shoving, like this pill for that, that pill for this and this side effect. And take this one to cover that side effect. Like, you're not going to have sex. You're going to gain weight. You know, that's not living. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. like, your solution is killing me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I tell people, you know, I was really programmed through D.A.R.E. And, you know, when we talk about the war on drugs mm-hmm. and with psychedelics, it wasn't that the psychedelics were proven to be harmful. The government was worried about too many people waking up. So I tell people, you know, I was programmed to believe that McDonald's was food and mushrooms was drugs. Yeah. Let's touch on the importance of this topic to someone who doesn't believe they need therapy. What would you say to that, Victor? Yeah, I think uh, the first thing I would say is I understand why people feel that way. Right. Um, There's there's I think there's several reasons why those sentiments come up. Right. The history of our our communities and the medical establishment institutions and what they've done to our communities there's distrust there and you have to respect that and you have to understand that and so um in the west we have this way of approaching um issues by pathologizing people Mm -hmm. right and so when you tell someone hey you might have depression or hey, uh, you know, you might have anxiety. There's there's a defensiveness that comes up because people feel like you're labeling me, right? You're make you're making it a problem for me, um, and uh, so I think that's one reason, right, why people say I don't need therapy. I remember when I first started telling you know my co- my my family, I'm going to therapy. It's like, why are you depressed? You got a good job, like you got a, you got a wife and a kid, like you shouldn't be depressed. Or like, are you crazy, right? Or talking to family and saying, hey, you should go to therapy. I'm not crazy. Why would I go to therapy? You know what I mean? So they could give me a bunch of pills. Yeah. And I and that's real, right? Because it's like part of my journey, right, when I said I hit a wall, it was because I went to the doctor. They diagnosed me with uh, major depression, uh, severe major depression, adult ADHD. And they were like, here's this pill, right? Um, here's this antidepressant. And then I'm like, cool. Um, now I feel anxious. They're like, here's some Xanax. Now I'm like, I can't focus. Here's some Adderall. Right. And by the time I looked up, I was taking four different medications and I'm like, um, people around me started saying like, yo, you don't like, you're acting different. Like what's going on with you. Right. And, and, um, so I get, I guess what I'm saying is I get why people have that reaction. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that it's not easy to to address trauma, right? Because once you open those doors up, if you don't have the support around you uh, and you don't have, uh, you know, access to adequate care, then you're stuck with it, right? And that's the same thing with psychedelics. Some people that I know have done psychedelics and they're like, why would I want to bring all this trauma up? And then I have, then I got to sit with it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think... I would say to those people is that I think I get it, right? Why you don't you think you don't need therapy? But I think the work that me and Duran and a lot of our colleagues are doing is reclaiming therapy and decolonizing it, right? So now we're starting to question like, what does this diagnostic manual mean? What does this label mean? Like, are you really, you know, trying not to label people and instead of saying like you have these symptoms and now you fit this description? It's like, what does this entire person's life look like? Mm -hmm. What does their history look like? What does their family look like? What does their environment look like? What does the the community look like that they live in? And then it humanizes it. And you're able to approach, especially coming from the backgrounds that we come from, uh, we approach therapy in a relational aspect, right? So, Mm -hmm. like, I care for the people that I sit with. Um, So I, I encourage people to go and seek out therapy and shop around for a therapist. You might, I've fired like a lot of therapists cause I'm a therapist who gets therapy. Right. Okay. So, um, sometimes you got to look for that one person that, that connects with you and it's not about fixing you. It's about you having somebody who will listen to you and who will validate your experience as a human being. Okay. Um, uh- I find that interesting that a therapist uses a therapist and then even hearing that information that you got to go through 
many therapists. You might want to try, you know, black therapist rock. You know, right. go find <laughs> go right. go find you the right one. Um, if I'm a person with PTSD, right, and and I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. I don't know. I just know I'm suffering from PTSD. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I heard about you know a, a psychedelics therapy. I heard about plant based medicines. Where do I start? Where do I go? How do I get started? I'm going to always tell people to do what makes the most sense for you. You know, I, I tell people I'm at a place in my life. I'm retired military. I have a, quite a bit of privilege, so I can do things that not, I couldn't do, you know, when I was 18 years old going through the military. Okay. Um, I say that because I don't want nobody to lose their job. You yeah. know, like people yeah. sometimes are so desperate for healing that they will do anything. And I'm all about harm reduction. Yes, you know, healing is there and available, but less, like you said, there's a time and place for everything. Um, so there's a, lots of different options, some that I've engaged in that weren't quite legal. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I know where I live. Things are, I know the policies where I live. I live in a very progressive place in D.C. You know, it's decriminalized where I'm at. Both cannabis and mushrooms is what we call decriminalized. Um, like you said, uh, we're really working to decolonize medicine in general because uh -huh. um, healing ain't new. You know, and these new. medicines aren't new. Cannabis isn't new. They're putting a new label on it, a new price tag on it. But none of this is new. This came from our ancestors and this has been around for many, many years. So I, I say, you know, know your options and know the best option for you. Uh, one of the options that I recommend to people is uh, I work at a place called Field Trip Health. It's a legal psychedelic clinic. It's the only legal psychedelic clinic that I know of that offers psychedelic-assisted therapy, and they're uh, rolling out 70 clinics across the country, across the world. So there's currently clinics in New York, in D.C., in Houston. There's like six or seven clinics in California. Um, that's a legal option that I think a lot of people uh, could consider. Um, you know, if you know a shaman or you know someone uh, in a more ceremonial and ancestral uh, way someone who does this work, um, you know, and that way, just know that you, you need to double check the standards on your um, your employment to make sure you're not going to get drug tested. Because I've had friends, you know, in or out of the military or in or out of the government setting, um, who have had to had a lot of anxiety afterwards because they weren't sure they were going to be able to keep their job. Mm -hmm. um, so I always say, you know, first things first is survival. Um, employment and food and getting your bills paid is part of that survival. So make sure that whatever option you're using, that you have a clear conscience as you're moving forward with that. The decolonization of uh, psychedelics, and I think is really important uh, to your point. This, this, these are practices that have happened for centuries through different cultures all across the globe. This is how people healed themselves before westernized medicine became uh, so prominent in uh, such big business. Um, can we talk about that decolonization? And then can we give examples of how these psychedelics were used uh, prior to them being illegal? Vic, you want to jump on that? Yeah. So um, I, I can give an example from my culture because okay. I've, I've really looked at um, the Arawak, you know, Indians and, and or indigenous people from Dominican Republic and the Caribbean and they had some, something called coova, which was a snuff that they would make um, out of the tree. I can't pronounce the, the, what they've named it. Um, and they would take it in a ceremonial setting together in, in a circle. And it was always about community, right? And we live in this Western society where everything's individual, everything we got to strive by ourselves. We got to stand on our own two feet and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. And so I think the way that we decolonize is understanding that the way that we heal is through community um, and, and ensuring that these medicines, when we approach them and we, we use them, whether it's in a therapeutic setting, whether you're, um, you know, going overseas and going somewhere else to, to seek a legal, you know, shaman experience or whatever it is, that you approach them with reverence and respect mm -hmm. and that you understand uh, that there's oral traditions that go back thousands of years in many different cultures across the world uh, that inform how this work should be done. And so as I look at how this is developing in the States, right, in the Western world, um, it concerns me, right, with, with we've seen what happened with the marijuana industry where there's yeah. this, uh, yeah. I just saw somebody, there was a lawyer who patented the DMT, like 5-MeO DMT pen, mm -hmm. right, 
um, not for the community, but he got a patent for himself, right? So that's that's a power grab, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think that goes directly against what these medicines were put here for, uh-huh. um, and also the the indigenous traditions that that support this work. Mm-hmm. Um, I am happy to say that I see a lot of people, Duran, myself, a lot of our colleagues and in different spaces who are working towards uh, making sure that there's reciprocity, making sure that we're honoring those traditions and honoring the medicine, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted mm-hmm. to say um, one thing that I'm really passionate about, too, is in the historical sense, in the traditional sense of a lot of the cultures, this medicine was given to the healers so that they could be more woke and conscious to help create more healing. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, a direct access type of thing. It was given to the people who were able to hold it and create space for others so that they could, you know, do their work in a more efficient way. And so that's something that I'm really passionate about as, you know, I have a lot of black therapists who have their own trauma and yeah. they are often terrified of these medicines as well because we're so far removed from it. We've been all taught that yeah. this is bad. You know, you're gonna lose your mind. You're gonna you know, not come back. You're gonna. We've all been kind of brainwashed into thinking that somehow you know nature is wrong or bad. So when is it unsafe? Because here's the thing: I don't want us to have a conversation and, and not talk about you know uh, everything you know, potential side effects, um, uh, processes that aren't done properly. You know, I was talking to a businessman who told me that psychedelics would be a great investment to make, right? Um, but he said if you're emotionally tied to uh, what they are, what they can possibly do, then you may be conflicted because most of the information, if I talk to my mother about it, she's going to say, oh, man, what's wrong with you? Like you were saying earlier, Duran, man, you're going to lose your mind doing that. You're going to get addicted. You know, everything else is going to fall short, right? And so how do you how do you explain that to my mother? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean? How do you mm-hmm. tell tell my mother, like, if you were to invest in this industry, it, you know, th- there won't be any moral code you're breaking. How do you explain that? Yeah, I think um, so most psychedelics have anti-addictive problems properties right okay. and actually um the the original 12 steps uh, uh aa mm-hmm. included psychedelics but when the the founder of that model tried to include that uh it, they weren't having it mm-hmm. at the time so i can say how i've interacted with my mother because when i was in seventh seventh or eighth grade i was in dominican republic and um uh i had some cousins who brought up you know, some mushrooms that grew out in the field and it didn't go well for me at the time. <laughs> uh, so it's been a process for me to to really um, get my mom to understand what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I think it's in, you know, she, uh, Duran Merch mentioned earlier about that historically the medicine would be taken by the shaman, right, and not uh, given out. And we're in a space now where people want the freedom to be able to explore their own consciousness. But I think the lesson in that for me is that you can, you know, you can make a difference in people's lives and inform them and educate them by how you carry yourself. And so Mm -hmm. even though my mom was like, man, those are like, what are you talking about? You know, I'd mess with her. There would be like little mushrooms growing out in front of her house, and I'd come out and be like, I'm about to eat this real quick. Right. And she flipped out. But the conversations got deeper when she saw that I had a different understanding of her experience and a different gratitude towards her about everything that she went through to get me to where I'm at. And when she saw that transformation in my life and everything that I was able to accomplish because of those experiences, then she was more able to listen. Right. So I I started to lead by just showing people by example, by example. Yeah. Hmm. And um you know, the medicine isn't for everyone, right? Because there are people who have some conditions that that it could affect them negatively. And that's why even when you're working with a shaman or you're working in a medical space assessment, if you're working with someone who's not properly assessing you, that's the first red flag that you should see. Like if somebody's just inviting you to come take some medicine and they're not asking, you know, what's your history and Mm -hmm. all of that, that's a red flag. Okay. I like that you pointed out, like, I'm not a user. You know what I mean? So I, I want to know what are those red flags. Yeah. So if someone isn't assessing you, that's a red flag, right? Yeah. Um, are there other red flags people should look out for? 
I would say another guideline that we get trained a lot on as uh, psychedelic therapists is uh, something called set and setting. Mm -hmm. So when people tell me, oh, I took, you know, LSD one time at a party and I had a panic attack. Like, well, your mindset, you know, that when we say set and setting, the first set is your mindset. What mindset did you have? Were you around people you trusted? Did you feel calm and grounded? Like at the clinic, at the field trip clinic, there was a lot of money and intention put into the environment. Yeah. You know, to really make you feel like, oh, wow, this is a warm, cozy place. Kind of recreating that womb environment, Reca recreating a home experience um, mm -hmm. where people can feel comfortable and really start to let their guards down. If your guards are up and your, you know, psychedelics basically just intensify whatever mood or you know, mindset that you're under. If you're already afraid and you're not sure about where you are, it's only going to get worse. It's going to amplify. And if there's no one there to bring you back, you know, calm you down or ground you and there's no process because we have a plan for that. Usually when we sit with you, we do, an, and like you said, an assessment. We find out what's appropriate for you or what would be helpful for you if you start to feel overwhelmed. How can I calm you? How can I support you? Right. It's very personalized. When you at a party, they, you know, they don't know what to do with you. If you start flipping out, no one knows. You know? So that mindset, set and setting, making sure you're in the right environment, mm -hmm. you have the right people around you and that you're able to really go deep within yourself. Um, but you got to trust the environment and trust the people before you can trust yourself to go that deep like that. OK, uh, so I want to ask you guys uh, for a direct example of how you saw psychedelic therapy. Mm -hmm really improved the quality of a person's life and what was the process they went through how many sessions you know even dosages if that's possible mm -hmm. okay you want to start Duran? i can give a recent example okay. actually i just saw a gentleman last friday mm -hmm. um at the clinic in dc and he on paper again you know is like everybody's dream life you know, wonderful partner that he's been with and madly in love with for seven years high paying professional um you know like very attractive physically he seems to have the life right and i i kept thinking about something that kanye said i know that's a <laughs> a, a little bit of a touchy topic but i love kanye because he was saying things that were so on point before we really understood how to integrate how mm -hmm. i un integrated in my life i tell people for me music was my first drug of choice you know when i would dissociate and and dream of something better for myself it was usually music involved in, at the background of that um, that uh, that healing for me, really music brought me a lot of healing and continues to bring me a lot of healing. But this gentleman, you know, he came into the office and he was all together. He had a very crisp shirt on, you know, very starched, very, you know, nicely starched. And I began to talk to him and there was like only so much he really wanted to tell me in the beginning because this is his first time meeting me. And uh, we he took the medicine and he got about 50 milligrams, I think it was, of ketamine. And he started to go into himself and he was saying, you know, I don't feel safe. I never feel safe. Mm -hmm. And that was his first time at 43 years old realizing this, that I never feel safe. And so as we were integrating it, we had the integration appointment um, following that, and he said, I think it's largely due. And he didn't really, I helped him kind of understand because some of it is so buried in us. You know, how do you go back to when you were one years old? How do you go back to something that happened to you at three? Because it's still in your brain. Or we just got to pull it born, out before right? you were born, yeah. when you were in the womb. Yeah. You know, how do you go back to that womb time trauma? So he went back to four years old and he realized that he's always felt broken or damaged. And a large part of that was because he was gay. Oh. So when I think about, you know, if you're black and you're poor and you're gay and, you know, all of these different intersections of being suppressed, your real true being, who you really truly are in the world gets, you know, just buried at a very young age and to pull that back out and say, Oh, there's a little boy inside of you that needs you that wants to be a part of your world that wants to be integrated. Cause that's what integration is about. All parts of us coming together as one. So we were just talking about mommy and daddy issues. You know, yes, we all have mommy and daddy issues, but as a woman, that part of me that didn't understand men that had a whole question mark around men wants to integrate is screaming for integration. Like we need men in our life and there's a whole absence here like we don't know how to navigate that so those are some of the things that have mm -hmm. been like you may not even be aware that it's in your mind you know running at the background of everything that you're doing what did kanye say what was the quote oh the uh highest people up have the lowest self-esteem 
the high the highest, highest people, people up, up have the lowest self esteem. A lot of the people that I see in psychedelics have all the money, all the resources, all the things on paper, but again, still ve- feeling very empty inside and not knowing who they truly are and how to show up as their full self in the world. Hmm. Thank you very much for that. I'm glad you remembered the quote. And um, and um, Kanye has always um, made very. I think he was just ahead of his time. And Brilliant. Co- you know, and just just coping with almost the sacrificial lamb in many cases, and speaking out about um, mental health and and what he was dealing with, even probably when he wasn't didn't even know what he was dealing with. Right. You know, he he shared it, and it opened a lot of conversations. Um. Um. What's his name? Met metal metal world. He changed his name. Metal world. Ron Artest. Ron Artest. Yeah, yeah. metal world peace. Um, there's another person who early on, I remember sitting maybe I don't know maybe t- ten years ago sitting mm-hmm. down talking with him about mental health issues. It was the first conversation of his kind, longer than that actually. About 2008, mm. we were talking about it, and it was the first time I ever had a conversation with someone who was really willing and open, like he came to sit and talk about it, you know. And at, I think um, I love it when folks who are in the public eye utilize their platforms as medicine, you know. I want to ask you about a couple things you have going on, Vic. Let's talk about, what is it, firesideproject.org? Yeah, so that's it's not my project. This is a, okay. a, a project by Hanifa. I want to say her last name is Washington. Hanifa, if you're listening, I'm sorry if I got your last name wrong. But uh, she's been working with uh, a bunch of other dope people. Um, and they cre- they launched this helpline, uh, this psychedelic support line, where if you're having a rough trip, uh, or you're having a rough time while you're on psychedelics, or you just need support around psychedelics, you can actually reach out to them. And they'll provide that support. So the website for that is firesideproject.org. And um, I just wanted to recommend a resource for people to make sure that if you make a decision about exploring, um, I always, you know, be safe. Uh, Harm reduction is number one. So make sure that you're, you know, doing your research um, and that you're staying as safe as possible. And, And that's a resource that you could use if and when you would have some kind of negative experience and need support and, and don't have immediate access to it. So, okay. What yeah. does a negative experience look like? Something I, that hasn't been integrated. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> it, I think yeah. it looks different for everyone. Right. Okay. But, but in my experience and, and, and the things that I've observed is that, um, med- the medicines are going to give you what they think you need. Right. And so sometimes, you take psychedelics, you know, if you take psychedelics recreationally at Burning Man and you might want to have a good time and you took, you know, some some psilocybin Mm -hmm. and the mushrooms are like, now you're going to think about your childhood in the middle of a party, right? Yeah. And so they they demand respect and and also for you to be able to um, ease into the experience, you have to learn to surrender to it, right? And so if you're fighting it, and you're like, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about that. Then that turns into a five hour loop of trying to push away all of these negative experiences that you don't want to think about that. In my experience, that's what a negative trip looks like for me um, and for the ones that I've observed. Um, and usually afterwards, a bad trip is, is just a trip that wasn't integrated. Um, in my experience, most people that do integrate those experiences end up whether they come out of the other end of that with more respect for the medicine <laughs> or um, they understand like, wow, this is something that kept coming up. Maybe I need to be paying attention to that. Okay. You do, Have you ever had a bad trip? I, I definitely have. It's a, it was a bad trip, but only because I failed to surrender. Like you said, mm-hmm. um, I have a very, uh, my physical body is very sensitive now since ketamine. Um, and I had a journey where, and mushrooms in me, oh, it's just, it comes back up often. Um, And so I had an experience where I was feeling like I'm ready to know all the secrets of the universe. Just pour it on. Give it to me. I want to know everything. And I took this mega dose. I was like, I'm going to take the biggest dose I've ever taken because I'm with my people. I trust them. I'm in a good place. I want to know it all. And I remember being my face in the toilet (laughs) for about four hours. And I was like, I get it. You're right. I don't need to know the secrets of the universe. I just need to put one foot in front of the other and stop trying to play God. You Mm -hmm. know, there, there, these are, this is nature. You know, me and my son, we refer to it as mother nature and father God. 
These are our loving parents that want the best for us, but they're not always going to tell us what we don't need to know. Mm -hmm. You know, some things are just outside of our reach and we just need to keep going on the the path that we're on. And so that was uh, a, a journey where I was like, okay, I got it. You know, stop playing God. You know, I know what I know. I know what I'm ready to know. Yes. You know, you're mm-hmm. only ready to, you, you don't know what you're not ready to know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know? you know what you're ready to know. Yeah. You don't know what you're not ready to know. <laughs> I like and that. I'll just add that, you know, with individuals who have severe trauma, like PTSD or, you know, a sexual abuse, et cetera, you know, bad trips can be that, ex- you know, that experience replaying in their mind um, and being triggered, you know, by that. So it, it looks differently for different people, but it, it definitely if you have a history of trauma, severe trauma, um, it can be something that can cause more trauma, right, if, if not taken seriously. If not taken seriously. Yeah. Um, this has been a very enlightening conversation for me, and, I hope, hope, and I, I'm sure for any, any of the viewers or listeners that are tuned in to this right now. So first and foremost, I want to thank you for being open and forthcoming about your experiences. We, we we haven't even really, we just touched the surface. I already know this. I know now that we sat and talked, so I'd love to do this again. Um, there's a, a film project, Transcendent, right, that you guys are a part of. Can we talk about that, Duran? Or yes, you know? we'd love to. Okay. I'll let Victor Le- tell Victor, you a little okay. more. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, when you talk about uh, how I've seen psychedelics transform people, um, I have a group of very close knit friends that are made up of, you know, my little brothers and and everybody that I grew up with in my hood. Right. It's like seven, seven or eight of us. And we always it's this group of men. We're all in our 30s or getting there that are able to cry together, are able to talk about our trauma together, are able to um, hold each other. Right. In a way that we weren't taught to. And we kind of were always on that path. But I feel like psychedelics helped us. Uh, continue that growth and really solidify it. And um, we we were always talking about like, damn, I don't think our relationship and like the stuff we'd be talking about, this doesn't seem like it's the norm and we should share this with people. And so uh, I told the Rand, I was like, yo, I got this idea for this documentary where we talk about black and brown men healing together and, and how psychedelics can help that. Right. Mm. And just showing and, and, and shattering the stereotype that we got to be like, you know, proud all the time and that we can't cry together and we can't go to therapy and we can't do all of these things. And so when I told Duran about that, Duran has an idea of, had an idea of taking a group of therapists from Black Therapist Rock and us going back to Africa and having an experience together there. And so um, this film is is all of that, right? It's, wow. it's, it's really... Uh, you know, we talked about our people being left behind with with the whole marijuana movement. Mm-hmm. And so this is, a, a, I think, a blend of us trying to educate our community while also empowering them by showing them what healing looks like. And not that we're showing up on camera like, look at us, we're healed. And, you know, we're mm-hmm. it's like, look, this is the process and we're still going through it. And even though you might see us in these positions that we're, you know, we might have good careers or whatever, we still got all these things that we're working through and really helping bring our people to the medicine uh, and educate them and bring them to it with respect and reverence and um, making sure that they also uh, are tapped in when it comes to what's going on with policy around yes. this. Are we included? Mm-hmm. Where's our therapist at? Are they getting trained, et cetera? So I want to thank you all for being on Sway in the Morning. I want to also say that you both are citizens a sway in the morning okay all right and then we'll look out for that transcendent film project we'll we'll be keeping you guys in tune with that we will definitely be feeding you information and look out for part two of this conversation anything y'all want to say in closing so yeah i just wanted to say that people who want to watch the trailer that we put together you can find it at pictureacolorforworld.com and um and you can donate there to help us raise the funds that we need uh, to finish the film, and we're really excited about putting this together and think that this is going to be impactful for our communities and it's going to bring much-needed education and awareness uh, around this topic. Um, and then the other thing that I'll add is that, uh, you know, I won't speak for Duran, but this is scary, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we're stepping out in this way. The whole world is going to see this, and I just, I just want our people and our community to be safe um, we're taking this risk because we believe in this medicine, 
but just keep yourself safe, take care of your family. If you're not ready to talk about these things publicly and it's something that's personal to you or you don't feel safe in doing that, that's okay. We're trying to do that work for our community and whenever you're ready, um, you know, you can you can share, but just keep yourself safe and, and we understand that for people of color talking about this is terrifying. It's just scary, yeah. yeah. Give out that website again? Yeah, it's uh, pictureacolorfulworld.com. Okay, and Duran, you want to say anything in closing? Yeah, I would say that part of safety is preparation and education. Uh, Victor and I were talking about that on the way here, and one of the main resources that I've used for education is the Ancestor Project. Um, so if you're on Instagram, follow the Ancestor Project, as well as Black Therapist Rock. We work together. We support each other. You know, it's all about healing. It's, it, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, right. and the fact that we have access to this again, I think it's just time. It's time for us to heal. Absolutely. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, and that's that's it for now. We'll be back at you soon. Peace.